Well, you could go ahead and open your Bibles to just the book of Genesis. Genesis 1. We'll be starting there. <clears throat> I'm fairly certain that everyone in here is familiar with the Marvel movies, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Even if you haven't watched the movies, you've almost certainly heard of them because they've become something of a cultural phenomenon over the past, I don't know, decade or more. We started with the movies about Thor and Captain America and all these other different superheroes, and then the, Avengers the, the move, uh, uh, heroes came together as the Avengers and all this kind of stuff. But what the Marvel movies did that was unique, that was groundbreaking as far as movies goes, is this idea of a meta story. They, they had all these individual standalone stories about the different heroes, but through all of those stories, there was these threads that linked together all the stories to br bring together into this grand story. It, the main threads dealt with these things called infinity stones. You don't need to know what those are, but this, there was this grand story that connected all the smaller stories, and that hadn't been done before in movies, at least not on that scale, at least not uh, in that way. Well, what they did might have been new for movies, but it really wasn't that new. God did it first. I mean, really, that's human history. All of human history is all these little individual stories connected by a grand story. That's actually how the Bible works. The Bible is a grand story. That Yeah, it's made up of all these little stories, but it's all connected. But many people, though, haven't learned to see that. Part of that's the way we, we've gotten into how we teach in Sunday school and other things like that, where maybe we learn the Bible stories as we grow up, right? We, we learn about Noah, and we learn about Joseph, we learn about David, we learn about Esther. And so, but normally we just learn these individual stories about this individual character, and oftentimes just with a moralistic point, like be courageous like Daniel, be kind like Ruth. And most often, the way the things have been taught over the years in churches and in Sunday schools is that we don't learn the big story, the, the grand story that connects all these little stories together. And if anybody was to ask you, what is the big point? What is the grand story of the Bible? I think most people would probably answer Jesus, right? Kind of like the classic joke about the, the Sunday school teacher who starts off his teaching of his second grade class with, by showing a picture of a squirrel. And he asks, does anybody know what this is? And little Johnny in the front row says, I'm pretty sure the answer is Jesus, but it look, kind of looks like a squirrel to me. Um, so a lot of us, I think, would know that, yeah, the, the grand story is in some way connected to Jesus, that he's who all the stories, all the teaching in the Bible points to, but I think a lot of people wouldn't know why that is or how that all connects together. But really, the Bible is this grand story of God's redemption of his creation, of, of humanity, and there are these threads, if you look for them, these motifs that connect the stories together. And all these threads, all these uh, motifs really do come together in Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do in this Advent season, in, in these uh, next four Sundays, well, really five because it'll culminate on Christmas Sunday, by the way, we are having service on Christmas Sunday. We're not canceling church for just because it's Christmas Day. So we will be having church. Anyway, um, I mean, well, how could we not? I mean, it's, it's, his, it's about Jesus, right? Uh, anyway, um, so that was a little advertisement, a little plug in there. But um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, through these Advent sermons, is we're, we're going to follow one of these threads, possibly one of the most important threads uh, motifs that connects through Scripture. This thread we're going to follow, I'm calling the line of the promise. Uh, some people call it the seed promise because it's connected to the seed or the offspring, these certain offspring along the way. We'll see, we see through Scripture there's these multiple promised offspring, these promised seeds, the children of the promise, right? All of those are previews of the ultimate child of the promise who comes uh, whose coming we celebrate on Christmas. It was actually our, our time in, in the book of Galatians that inspired me about this uh, series. I could even say it maybe gave me the conviction that we needed to do this 
series because Paul's been using all these Old Testament references uh, throughout Galatians, and he's assuming that his Gentile audience, Gentiles like us, knew what he was talking about, that they knew how the Old Testament connected together like this. He talked about the seed of Abraham. He talked about how Jesus was the singular seed of Abraham. He mentioned the fullness of time in which God sent his son, and he talked about Isaac, the child of the promise, and all of those things are part of this line of the promise that I'm talking about. They're all parts of that thread that we're going to be talking about. And also, one of the cool things that happens when you start to see this thread that weaves through and connects all these stories is that many times it clears up confusion in some other area. You know, there's all these little stories sometimes that we find confusing. What, what's that even there for? What is that saying? And sometimes when we see this idea of the line of the promise, it's like, oh, okay, maybe that, maybe that makes a little more sense now. So along the way where it makes sense, I'm going to kind of touch on some of those little things. See, see how this line of the promise idea actually may, shows you how that makes sense. That sheds light on that little story. But that's just the sideshow. The main point of this series is to reveal Christ. That is what we're going to be doing in here. And I have a few goals in this series that I pray that, I will, that we'll be able to accomplish. I want us to see and be amazed at the sovereignty and the power of God. Because God orchestrates his purposes across the centuries through all these different people. So I want us to see that. I want us to gain a better understanding of how the Bible fits together, of how the Old Testament uh, builds this anticipation that leads up to the one who comes on Christmas Day, or whatever day he comes. We celebrate it on Christmas Day. It doesn't, we don't know if it's the exact same day. And then I also want us to get, gain this sense of waiting and watching and anticipating this one who would come. I mean, yeah, we know who it is already, right? But Eve didn't, and Abraham didn't, and the prophets didn't. They were building this sense of anticipation. And so maybe if we kind of gain some of that same sense of anticipation, maybe we, when we get to Christmas Day, will feel the same kind of wonder and joy that they would have. Going, oh, this is the one. And then our joy that we get from this fulfillment of all these promises comes from more than just the presence under the tree more even just than family members around the dinner table with us. It comes from Christ himself, because we've seen that this is the one that all the centuries, all the generations have been waiting for. And so this first Sunday of Advent, we're going to talk about the beginning of the promise. It is the first promise. We could call it the mother promise for a lot of different reasons, and it's found in Genesis 3.15. But first, before we get to the promise... We need to talk about the curse, because the curse forms the backdrop for the promise. It's the reason why the promise was made. So we're going to talk about the curse, and then we're going to talk about the promise itself. And then we're going to kind of wonder, along with these saints of old, about who is it that's going to fulfill this promise? And when will this one come? Okay, so to give the appropriate context, we actually need to start with, in the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth, because that is the beginning. That is where everything starts. There was nothing, and then God spoke, and then there was something. God spoke the universe into, into existence. Not, a, not just there was like some dirt laying around, and he, and he kind of formed it into a ball, and there's the world. There wasn't anything. There wasn't even physical space. So he formed actually the physical space in which things could exist, and then he formed the atoms and the molecules from which stuff could be made, and then he formed it together into the things that were. He created the skies, he created the oceans, he created the dry land, he created the creatures that would inhabit those spaces, the birds, the fish, the animals. And at each step along the way, God looked, and everything that he made was good. It was all good. It was exactly as God wanted it to be. And as the crowning jewel of his creation, God made mankind. He made man in his own image, after his own likeness. And the only time in all the process of creation that God said something was not good was when he had made only the man. 
And he looked and he said it was not good for the man to be alone. So then God made the woman and he gave her to the man. And God to the, gave the man and the woman responsibility. It says this in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every uh, creature that crawls on the earth. So this was their task. They had a job to do. They were something that God put them on the earth for. This was their purpose. And so now, after God had made all these things, God kind of took a step back, and he delighted in his creation. And he said, it is very good. There were no flaws. There were no blemishes. There was no death. There was no disease. God had provided also for all the creatures of his creation, but particularly for the, for the man and the woman, he provided for them everything they needed. He provided them food, Genesis 129. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed, this will be food for you, and for the wildlife of the earth, and, and everything had the food that it needed, had everything they needed. He gave them this food. He gave them each other. Um, of course, most, most importantly, he gave them himself. They had this close, personal relationship with God. They would go for walks with him in the garden. There was only one rule that God gave Adam and Eve. He said, do not eat from the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. And unfortunately for all of us, there was another inhabitant of the garden, the serpent. And this wasn't just any old snake. This serpent was empowered by the enemy, the one we call Satan, the deceiver. And he spoke to the woman, and he cast, doubt, cast into doubt God's loving providence. He said, God's holding out on you. God doesn't really love you completely. He cast doubt on God's integrity and on God's love. And so he made her think that God was holding out on her. He, he made her... Th Eve think that she could get something better outside of God's loving care, something that he wasn't giving her that was good for her. And so she ate the forbidden fruit. And then her husband Adam ate also, and then everything changed. Their disobedience brought a curse upon creation. So God came and he pronounced judgment upon all of those involved, he said to the woman that she would have pain in bearing children, Genesis 3.16. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. So she would still need to accomplish the purpose that she had been given to be fruitful and multiply, but now that would come with difficulty. Now that would come with pain. God told the man that the ground was cursed because of him. Genesis 3.17, he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. So the man would still have to accomplish his purpose to work the ground, to, to rule over creation in such a way that he would subdue it, but now it would not cooperate with him. Now it would work against him. And later in Romans 5, Paul tells us that the curse was more than just pain in childbearing and difficulty in growing food. Romans 5.12 says that just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned. So the curse that came upon mankind and upon all of creation was death. It was corruption. It was decay. And you know what? This is something that every one of us can see, right? We can all tell that the world is broken. If you stop someone on the street and you say, what, what's messed up about the world? What's, what's broken about the world? They could give you a whole list. Nobody's going to say, no, it's not broken. Everything's perfect. It's good. No, no one's going to say that because we all can see that the world is broken. 
We know, everybody knows that something is very, very wrong with this world and, and with humanity in general. We are born through pain. We are born to trouble as sparks fly upward, as Job said, as it says in the book of Job. It wasn't Job himself, but one of his friends. But our world is filled with pain and with violence and disease and decay and death. And it is true for us, just as it was what, what Jacob told Pharaoh, that our f- years are few and evil. The sin of mankind has corrupted God's creation, and it has corrupted us. And it's true for all of us what God said to Adam, that we are dust, and to dust we will return. But even in the midst of this darkness, and that does sound really dark, doesn't it? Even in the midst of this darkness, there is a glimmer of hope. There is a glimmer of light. When it seems that all hope is lost, God makes a promise. So it's right in the middle of God's pronouncement of judgment because of this disobedience, because of this rebellion. Right in the middle of that that set of things that he says of judgment, God makes a statement that constitutes a promise. I'm calling it a promise, even though he doesn't have some formal lead up like, I promise to do such and such. It doesn't have the structure of a covenant, like when he makes a covenant with Abraham or makes a covenant with David. But God said something will happen. And when God says something will happen, that's a promise. Because God always, what he says is always true. And as God says in Isaiah 46, this is God himself speaking. Isaiah 46 says, I am God and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place, and I will do all my will. So it is a promise. And the promise comes in the midst of this judgment that God is pronouncing upon the servant, the serpent who deceived Eve. And this is what he says. He says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, that's because you have deceived the man and the woman, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So this is the first promise of redemption. As I said, we could call it the mother promise, both because it concerns the offspring of the woman and because it is the promise from which all other promises flow. It says there will be hostility between the offspring or the seed of the woman and the seed or the offspring of the serpent. And when we see a word like seed or offspring, we always, the question we have to ask is, is, is this talking about one or is this talking about many? And the answer is, to a degree, both. What God says is true of the many offspring, but it is focused in on one offspring. And we know that it's focused on one because right after he says, there will be this hostility between your offspring and her offspring. He says, he, he, singular, will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. So God has declared in this statement that one day there will be a singular human being, a descendant of Eve, and this promised one will strike the serpent. Really, he will strike the power behind the serpent. He will strike Satan himself. He will execute God's judgment on Satan. And that doesn't just mean that he's going to destroy Satan, although that's part of it. It also means that he will destroy the fruit of Satan's deception. He will destroy the works of the devil. And think about what that means. It was Satan's deception that started the chain reaction that brought about the curse. It was Satan's lies that tempted Eve to sin and Adam after her. And it was because of that sin that the relationship between uh, mankind and God was broken and why every other relationship has been shattered and corrupted. It was because of sin that death and decay entered the world. So God's promise of judgment on Satan means a reversal of the curse. It means dealing with sin. It means the ending of death. It means the restoration of relationships between mankind and creation, between mankind and each other, between the men and women, 
And most importantly, it means the restoration of the relationship between mankind and God. In this promise, God declares that through his promised one, he will restore the world to the way it was when it was created. There will be no more violence, no more death, no more wars, no more disease. Isaiah 65 gives us this picture. It says in verse 17, For I will create new heavens and a new earth. The past events will not be remembered or come to mind. Then be glad and rejoice forever in what I am created, creating, for I will create Jerusalem to be a joy and its people to be a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will no longer be heard in her. And then jumping down to verse 23, they will not labor without success or bear children destined for disaster, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord along with their descendants. Even before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like cattle, but the serpent's food will be dust. They will not do what is evil or destroy on my entire holy mountain, says the Lord. So this promise constitutes a return to Eden, and yet maybe even better than Eden. Humanity will be restored to our original purpose, we will be able to enjoy a relationship with God. We will be able to be fruitful and multiply without pain. We will be able to rule over the earth and to tend the garden that God has made. And there is one man whom God is sending to do this. That is what the promise says. One offspring of the woman will strike down the serpent and will end the curse. That is one wonderful promise, isn't it? That is an anchor of hope. But the question for mankind from the very beginning has been, do you believe it? Do you believe this will happen? Do you believe that God will do this? Are you watching? Are you looking for that promised one who will end that curse? And the wait's been going on for thousands of years. It has, but the, the faithful ones in every generation are those who are watching and waiting for this one who will come looking for the one whom God promised. Because the faithful ones know that God exists, and they know that he is faithful, and that he will do as he had promised. So the faithful ones trust in God's love for his creation and for humanity such that he will bring about restoration. You know what? It's not just the faithful ones who know that God will do what he said. Satan also knows that God will bring about what he said. So, so Satan has been constantly throughout human history looking for ways to intercept the promise, to, to break this line of the promise, to corrupt the offspring. And so both the faithful ones and the enemy we see watching and waiting from the very beginning. So after we see this, after the Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, Adam and Eve had relations, and Eve became pregnant. And it says in Genesis 4.1, The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. So the implication of what Eve says here is that when Cain was born, she thought that he might be the promised child, that he might be the promised one. Because the promised one, remember, was that a male child, a he, would strike the serpent. And Eve says, I have gotten a male child with the Lord's help. So the question in her mind is, is this the one? Is this the one who will help, who will break the curse? And as you probably know, anybody who knows the story knows that unfortunately that was not the case. Cain did not break the curse. He actually demonstrated the power of the curse over mankind because he was the first murderer among humanity. He killed his own brother, Abel. And in doing this, he showed that even though physically he was a descendant of the woman, spiritually speaking, he was more of a descendant of the serpent. So he followed in the wickedness and the rebellion of Satan. And so the extent of the damage of Satan's deception is brought starkly into view. 
In fact, we see later in Genesis 4 that Cain's descendants continue to follow, follow in his same rebellion and in his same violence and wickedness. And so the first male child who was born was not the promised one. But then God gave Adam and Eve another son, and he was named Seth. And he didn't follow in the same rebellion that Cain did. So he was not an offspring of the serpent in that way. So he was a true offspring of the woman, but he was not the promised one. He didn't strike the serpent. He didn't bring restoration. But at least now the line of the promise continues. Because then Seth has another son, has his own son. And so now we see that it's through the descendants of Seth that the line of the promise will continue. But when we get to Genesis 5, we begin to understand that the wait is going to be longer than anyone hoped. Genesis 5 is the genealogy from Adam through Seth and on down, and it names generation after generation following the same pattern. Genesis 5 verse 3 says, Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. Adam lived 800 years after he fathered Seth, and he fathered other sons and daughters. So Adam's life lasted 930 years, then he died. And it continues over and over again, generation after generation, then he died. Then he died. So we see that the curse is in full effect. None of those who were born in this line were the promised one. None of them could end this curse. But again, at least the line of the promise continued. One small glimmer of possibility pops up with Enoch. The text says that he walked with God. He had some special close relationship with God, but he was not the one either. God, it says God took him away. He didn't personally have to experience death, but he also did not remove death from the world. The next major ray of hope comes at the end of the genealogy in, chapter, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, it says Lamech was 182 years old when he fathered a son, and he named him Noah, saying, this one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. So the words of Lamech show, one, one that the recognition of the curse was still very fresh in people's minds, but it also shows that what else, the other thing that was fresh still in some people's minds, was the hope of God's promise that one would come who would remove the curse. Lamech hoped that his son would be the one to do it. The name Noah actually is related to the Hebrew word for rest. It also sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for, for comfort or relief like we see in this passage. And what happened, what's going on here is Lamech is making a word play on the name of his son, showing that he hoped that relief from the curse would come through Noah, through his son. And Lamech's words are not just an empty wish. They are actually prophecy. But Lamech didn't really have any idea about exactly how God would fulfill that prophecy. But you can see how this longing for the relief of the curse would have been strong in someone who really worshiped God, particularly when you see in Genesis 6, this description of the rampant wickedness and violence that was spreading over the entire earth. And you realize that Lamech, someone who actually followed God and wanted to do what God said, lived in that environment, lived among those kinds of people. And of course, so did Noah as well. And I mean, this curse was vividly evident. Genesis 6.5 says, When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time, that's when the Lord decided to purge the earth. But the, the reason why this wickedness and this corruption was so widespread over the earth was definitely partly because of the sin of mankind. The, the Adam's sin had spread through his descendants, and so all human beings were sinful, but it was also partly because Satan was actively promoting it. He was doing whatever he could to stop God's promise in Genesis 3.15 from ever happening. And I think this perhaps helps us understand Genesis 6.2 and 3, which is a passage that 
many people find confusing. It's, it's very heavily debated, and I'm not going to settle this right now, but I think I'm convinced that this is really how you should understand it. Because the, the idea of this line of the promise, I think, is what helps shed light on it. This is what it says. It says, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. And I won't get into all the debates on this. We don't have time for that. But I'm fairly certain that the sons of God here that it's talking about are angels. And the angels, uh, these are the angels who followed Satan in his rebellion. And which actually corroborates with what Jude says in Jude verse 6, but we're not going to go there right now. So in Genesis 6, these evil fallen angels take on physical human form and have relations with human women. And the reason that they did that, this is again, the line of the promise concept flows through this. The reason to do that is that Satan wants to corrupt the bloodline. He wants to make sure that there is not an offspring of the woman who is available who could crush his head. Kind of a defensive mechanism, right? And this, this widespread corruption of the human bloodline may be an additional reason, besides the, the widespread violence and wickedness, that God decided to purge all living things from the earth. Because we, that, those, that corruption needed to be wiped clean. But the good news is, Satan was unable to corrupt all human bloodlines. So when God said he was going to wipe mankind from the face of the earth, it says in Genesis 6, 8, Noah, however, found favor with the Lord as grace. So Noah would bring relief from the curse, or would he? The question is, would he? And was he the promised one? Because he has found favor with the Lord. Well, there is a sense in which those things could be yes. It was through Noah that God preserved mankind, along with the rest of the animals, because all other living creatures, including all human beings, perished in the flood, all except Noah and his family and the animals with him on the ark. So all of those of the line of Cain and any others who joined them in that wickedness were purged from the earth. So to one degree, the results of Satan's deception were swept away. The earth was wiped clean. And so that seems, sounds pretty good. That might sound a little bit promising. And then after the flood receded and, and Noah and the rest of them came out of the ark, unfortunately it became fairly clear that the curse was not yet lifted. Because Noah planted a vineyard and he made some wine and he got falling down drunk. And so we see that Noah brought sin with him on the ark. Sin was like a virus that had gotten into mankind, and if any human being's descendants of Adam were on the ark, they are bringing sin with them, because sin is in us. So Noah was not the one who would bring restoration from the curse. He needed restoration himself. We, we see additional indication that the curse is not gone because God gave a rule to Noah and his sons about what should be done if one human being killed another. So that's an acknowledgement, an expectation that violence is not done. It's not over with. There will still be violence and there still will be wickedness. The cur curse is still in effect. But the good news is the line of the promise continues. The line of the promise now continues in Noah and his sons. It continued because God is faithful to his promises. If God says he will do something, he will do it. So Noah was not the promised one, but he was a preview. He was a, a type, if you will, of the promised one. Through him, God preserved mankind, preserved all the other living creatures. All who were in Noah, remember the phrase in Christ, all who were in Noah in the sense of being his family or being with him on the ark, were saved from God's judgment. So you can see how he's sort of a, a type of the one who would come. Also, through Noah, God added another promise to the first one. God promised that he would never again destroy the entire earth. At least not in that way. He said this, Genesis 8, 21. 
Noah had made a, a, a sacrifice to the Lord. It says, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings. Even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. So in making this promise, God was guaranteeing the first one. In other words, he's saying that the earth would continue to exist. It would continue on with days and weeks and, and years until the promised one comes. So until the promised restoration happens, the world will stand. It will continue to exist until it is restored. So every time you see a rainbow then, you can be promised, reminded that God keeps his promises. He promised that the world will continue until the curse is broken. You can take that to the bank. That is exactly the truth. That is exactly what will happen. And so we see then that the line of the promise continued on in Noah and his sons. It, was, it is now, we understand that it is one of Noah's descendants who will strike the serpent. And so mankind and all of creation continued to wait. And we do get one final hint about where to look for the one we're waiting for here in Genesis 9. After Noah had his little bout of drunkenness, one of his sons treated him dis disrespectfully, and, and he makes statements about all of his three sons. And we're not going to get into the details about those. And by the way, in case you don't remember the names of his sons, they're Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And in Noah's statements about his three sons, one of those sons is raised above the others. Something special is said about one of them. He said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. He doesn't mention God in connection with either of his other two sons. And so in these words, it becomes clear that Shem enjoyed a special relationship with God, more so than his two brothers. And so this indicates to us that the line of the promise will continue through Shem, through Noah's son Shem. And this is actually confirmed later in Genesis 11, where it talks about the genealogy of Shem down to Abram. But that's a preview of next week. We're going to talk about Abram next week. So we're left with God's promise. God promised that someone would come. He would send someone, an offspring of the woman, which means a human being, a male human being, because it says he. And this promised one, this promised child, would strike the serpent. He would destroy the works of Satan. He would end the curse. He would restore humanity, and he would restore all of creation to its original goodness. But now, after having seen Cain and Seth and Enoch, and Noah, we see that none of them were the promised one. And so we continue to wait. But here's a couple of takeaways that you can chew on this week while you wait. First, remember that God delights to shine light into the deepest darkness. In the middle of God's pronouncement of jud judgment upon the serpent and upon Adam and Eve, he also offered grace. He promised to end the curse, to bring restoration. And God still does that. Shining light into darkness, he still does that in all kinds of big ways and small ways. So you might have experienced dark times, whether it's times of illness, times of falling back into sin, times of final financial hardship or isolation or relational separation or whatever it might be. And into those situations, God shines his light of hope. In fact, one of the biggest instances of that kind of light is, it is a preview of the final redemption. It's the redemption that God brings into individual lives every day. Every day. People are living in the darkness of sin, and God shines the light of his love in the face of his son, Jesus Christ. We're all born into this desperate situation. We all deserve the same judgment that humanity got in the flood. But if you recognize your sin, and if you agree with God that you deserve his wrath, you plead for his mercy instead, then he will indeed welcome you, and he will forgive you, and you can have spiritual restoration now. Without waiting for the final restoration, you can have spiritual restoration now. That is one part of the curse that can be lifted right now 
in your life. If you will just go to God. I urge you to go to God, ask for his mercy, and surrender yourself to Christ. And you can have spiritual restoration today. A second takeaway that you can hold on to this week is that God is faithful. God will always fulfill his promises. When he says that something will happen, it will happen. Now, it might not happen in exactly the way we thought it was going to happen or in the way we may have wanted it to happen, but it will happen. It will happen the way God wants it to happen, and it will happen at the time God wants it to happen. He fulfills his promises on his schedule, not on ours. And so a following, following from that, a third takeaway is that we must wait on God. We must wait on God. We must trust him to fulfill his promise in his own way at his own time. See, it's God's faithful ones in every generation who wait for him, who trust him at his word. In fact, that's the essence of faith, of trusting in God. It's just trusting that he will do what he has said. And then waiting for him to do what he has said. That is what faith is. And I could, wait, I could list passage after passage from Scripture that encourage us, that command us, that exhort us to wait on the Lord. In fact, actually, that would be a good exercise this week. It would just be simple with Google. Google Bible verse, wait on the Lord. And you will find, it, you'll get a long list, and you could just meditate on those all week. A lot of them comes from the Psalms, but they're from all over Scripture. And you'll be encouraged, I think, as you read those, because every generation of God's people have had to wait on the Lord, wait for him to fulfill his promises. They, they had to wait for the arrival of the promised one. We now have to wait for the return of the promised one. But our attitude should be like the psalmist in Psalm 130, where he says, I wait for the Lord. I wait and put my hope in his word. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. And if you've ever been a sentry, you know what that means, <laughs> waiting like a watchman for the morning. And so as James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote in James chapter 5, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. So you, will you wait with me? Let us wait. Let us anticipate our celebration of the Lord's first coming, and as we celebrate God's faithfulness to fulfill his promise to send the offspring of the woman, we know also that he will be faithful to fulfill his promise to restore all creation. So let us wait, knowing just that just as the promised one came once, so he will come again, as he has said. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do praise you, for you are faithful. You fulfill all your word, and all your promises are true and right. Help us to wait. Help us to wait patiently, trusting you to fulfill your promises, just as you have said, in your way and in your time. But help us to always be watching and looking for the fulfillment of your promise, that we might bring glory to you and honor to your name. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.